Good deal. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Okay. And uh, Adam, would you like to start us off with a prayer tonight? Sure. Dear Father, thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. Thank you that you have loved us when we so often are unlovable. Thank you that you have called us to be your people and brought us uh, into the light and help us tonight to have a study where we can draw near to you and think about your presence and put your word in our hearts and our minds and our lives. In your son's name, amen. Amen. Okay, so just a real fast summary over where we were um, last Wednesday night. We talked about God's presence in the Old Testament. And there's there's more to this than just these points, but these are the big ones, I think, unless you can think of any others. Um, God's original intent, he created humanity, Adam and Eve, to be in the garden with him together. And he was present and they were there together. That was what God created and that was what God intended. But sin entered into the world and so separation from God happened. Got removed from the presence of God. There's more, uh, especially in the Exodus story, but then the tabernacle happened. God said, build this tent. I'm going to live here. At the very end of Exodus, God's spirit glory comes down and inhabits the tabernacle. People rebelled against God. We get to 1 Samuel 4. I think that was our passage. 1 Samuel 4 in Shiloh, God took off. He said, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm not doing it. The glory has departed. Same thing happened with the temple. God came back, lived in the temple. The people rejected him, and the glory left. That was Ezekiel 11, right? Mm -hmm. I think so, somewhere in that neighborhood. And the, the, the story throughout the prophets is a promise of, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I, I want to live among my people. I want to dwell among my people. Sin has prevented it up to this point, but uh, God is going to create a way. And so tonight, the idea is to move into the New Testament and to see the ultimate fulfillment of God's presence and dwelling with the people uh, and how he does that and what that looks like. Yeah, because yeah, where we left off was just a desiring for a permanent lasting presence. Yeah. Like you talked about the cycle of Eden, the tabernacle, the temple, every time after a while, man is so sinful that God packs up and leaves. And yeah. so when and what are we going to get that's going to bring us permanent closeness and presence with God? That's right. That's right. So tonight we have three basic things. Let me just go ahead and tell you what the three things are on the front side. Number one, we're going to talk about Jesus and God's presence in Jesus and how Jesus came to build the new temple. Uh, we're going to talk about God's people, the church, as that new temple. And we're going to talk about heaven as the ultimate fulfillment of that and ultimately living and dwelling in the presence of God. Uh, that'll probably just be it. We'll just touch on that because there's more to do with that later in this class. But those are at least the three things that we're going to do tonight. I'm going to start in John, in John chapter one and verse one, please. After an entire class last week of talking about God's presence and how this is really one of the major themes of the Bible. I don't know how we can miss this at this point. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So that's really important. Here comes Jesus. He's the word. He's God. In verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he talks about seeing the glory. That's tabernacle language. That's uh, just like the Shekinah, the glory of God that inhabited the tabernacle and the temple. That word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so we have in Jesus actually God's presence. Your tabernacle comment. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, looking at the language of John 114, it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And this idea of dwelling among us, that's the same kind of language that was used in Exodus 25, where God said, build me a tabernacle so I can dwell among you. Yeah. You know, and it, what used to be a building, a physical structure is now being perfected in Jesus coming to dwell among, to reside among, to be right there among. We talked about sort of the, the 
limitations of having a building and you can point to it and you can say it's there, but yet at the same time, people weren't fully coming into contact with God. Well, now the perfect is here. People can see Jesus walk beside him, share a meal with him. Yeah. It's presence in a whole new way. That's right. I love that. The, the, the When I think of especially God's presence in the Old Testament with the tabernacle and the temple, yeah, I got to think two things at the same time with this. Number one, you look across the way and you say, wow, that's God's house. And I can see the cloud and that's the presence of God, the creator of all things. He's right over there. That's amazing. The accessibility of God. But then you have the tent and the fence and the tribe surrounding. And there is this very clear picture of it unaccessible or inaccessible, in, inaccessible, Inaccess- inaccessibility. Mm-hmm. Um, Yes, he's right over there, but I can't access him. And now in the New Testament, we have Jesus, God, who's dwelling among us, reaching out, touching people, as you say, sitting down and eating a meal with them. This ought to be something that sends us into great big wow mode when we think this is as close to Eden as anybody has been since Genesis 3 Mm -hmm. to be in the presence of God. It's huge. Okay, so... I'm just going to refer to this in Matthew chapter 11, where Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for your souls. Remember the point last time we talked about no presence, no rest. That's really what we're doing in this class. We're talking about how do we get a sense of um, rest and peace uh, to get away from the anxiety and, and the, the struggles of life and all of that. How, how do we get that, especially now in the world that we're living in? It It's impossible to have it without the presence of God. Mm-hmm. And, and when we talk about it, the presence, no presence, no rest. What is the thing that makes no presence? Sin, always, in every case, in Eden, in the tabernacle, in the temple. If there's sin, there's no presence. If there's no presence, then there's no rest. That's going to be a really important formula yep. moving forward. Okay, go to John chapter 2. As we introduce this topic, I am dropping a question in the chat, just asking you to think about what's the significance of Jesus coming and physically physically dwelling among us, um, which, which we're kind of beginning to look at here in John 1 and John 2, and um, share some thoughts on that here in a moment. We always love to see people chime in in the comments. So, yeah. so jump in and uh, add to the discussion here with us. Excellent. I'm going to start reading in John chapter 2 and verse 13. Um, in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, whenever we read about the cleansing of the temple, that doesn't happen until the end of the Gospels. But in, in, in John's Gospel, Jesus does it twice. He does it at the start and he does it again at the end. So this is the first one in John's gospel, starting in chapter 2 and verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His problem was you came into God's house, God's dwelling place, and you've turned it into a place of cheap business to do to, to make a buck. In verse 17, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus said, this is important. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. I'm sure that his audience thought he was talking about the actual temple complex. Mm -hmm. But we know he was talking about his own body, so let's change the words to make it what he said. Kill me. Jesus says, kill me. The temple, the dwelling place of God. And in three days, I'm building it up again. And they can't handle it. The Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. This conversation 
of Jesus saying, destroy the temple, and in three days I'm going to build up God's temple again, becomes a major, major uh, piece of the gospel story. And I'll talk about that here in just a second. But you asked a question, and I see some things popping up there. Um, I'm sorry, did I take you off guard? No, not okay. at all. So, <laughs> yeah, so it, it really ties along with, with what we're talking about, the significance of Jesus physically dwelling among us. Um, so from the wises, they were talking in, in Matthew chapter one about Jesus coming in human form as a return to be with his people and this shoot from the stump of Jesse and, and all that was prophesied that God would come and reign and, and be among us. Oh, on that one. Yeah. The shoot from the stump of Jesse. Remember, remember Jesse and then David and God's promise to David was your son is going to build my house. So the shoot coming out from the descendant of Jesse from David is huge in this conversation of Jesus, David's descendant, building God's house. Mm -hmm. It's a huge part of it. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's great. Um, from Steve Shetlaw, he said part of the significance is that the rest, at least partially, is available now. Jesus coming on the earth, which we're going to talk about at the end, kind yeah. of the fulfillment and yet the fulfillment to come. Yeah. And he's, he's already on those same wavelengths. And then... One from Amanda, Jesus being among us knows and understands our struggle from a human perspective, and it helps to know God isn't just sympathetic, but empathetic. Yeah. That, you know, I jotted down Hebrews too about Jesus, our great high priest, becoming like us in every respect and knowing what we're going through. And I think that's, that's a, a well said by Amanda. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. When you think of high priest, you have to associate that with the temple. With the dwelling place of God. That's Somehow where they I didn't work. put that together. This is, this is, I mean, I've been really shocked making all of these notes and reading through this. This is such a major Bible theme. We need to talk about this more. I mean, this, the presence of God needs to be a bigger part. This idea in John chapter two, Jesus says, destroy this temple in three days. I'll build it up again. Remember at the end of Matthew and Mark, those were the accusations that people made to have Jesus ultimately arrested. There's a bunch of liars running around. Nobody could get their story straight. And finally, somebody came in and said, I heard him say that he's going to tear the temple down and build it up, which, which the fact, this is the fact that somebody heard Jesus saying that, and that they said that as an accusation as his, at his death. The fact that that was out there in play tells me, this is a much bigger part of the conversation. Like Jesus going around talking about, I'm going to build the temple. It's a big part of his work. Mm -hmm. And part the Jews were so attached to the temple that I think anything that he would have said about the temple in some ways was a lightning rod. Oh, like, yeah. We have reference to that. You know, the uh, his disciples will marvel at the temple and he says, it's not going to last. He's pointing yeah. to a greater temple. Yeah. I mean, think about those. Uh, the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Jesus, look at all of the beautiful buildings of the temple. And he says, it's going away. And, I mean, that's, that's, those are fighting words. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at Mark 14 here real quick. Mark adds something about this that I think is really neat. Mark 14 and verse 56. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Mark is the only one who adds that part. They say, We heard Jesus say he was going to build a temple not made with hands. The presence of God and the dwelling place of God and the temple not made with hands. Humans didn't put this thing together. This is of divine origin. So these are all really important. Remember, whenever uh, people were mocking Jesus, too, as he hung on the cross, you who said you were going to destroy the temple and build it in three days again. This, this is a part of the gospel story. Mm -hmm. Okay. At the end of John chapter 2, it says he was speaking of the temple of his body. That's what's going to lead us into this next section, talking about the temple of Jesus' body, the body of his people, what we're just going to go ahead and call the church, the collective body of, of Jesus' people. That's going to be really important. But I think since we're talking about presence and the dwelling place of God, 
that Matthew chapter 27 and verses 50 and 52 should probably be a part of this conversation. Whenever Jesus died, the curtain separating the most holy place where God's presence was and everything else, that curtain was torn from top to bottom. The idea of top to bottom is God's doing the from ripping. Above. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is, that's extremely important for this conversation because what we're doing is we're saying that thing that, that blocks us off from the presence of God when Jesus died, that curtain went away. Now we have this unhindered, unfettered access to the actual presence of God which we haven't had since Genesis chapter three. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at how big this story has been in, in the Bible. It started here with the presence of God and it's taken this far to finally get to the actual place where God is and to have access. It's a, it's a pretty amazing picture. Okay, so the first thing is Jesus and the presence of God, the actual presence of God and Jesus and his work saying in three days, I'm going to build the temple. I'm going to create the place where God dwells, the, the dwelling place of God. So number one, Jesus. Anything on that point before we move forward? Were you going to read the verses from Hebrews at all? Uh, if you're there, you can read them. But... I'll pull out just a couple if, if you don't mind. So Hebrews chapter 10 kind of, I think, brings to a really nice conclusion this idea of, of the temple and the access that we have. I'll just read a verse or two from Hebrews 10 starting in verse 19, where he says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. And I think it was helpful for me last week when we walked through what the tabernacle was and what the temple was to understand a little bit more when he says, we have confidence to enter the holy place. That would have been unheard of. Yeah. You, you, you oh, weren't yeah. just charging in there. There was a curtain and there was special access and it was it was very limited. And now we can all have confidence to be that intimately uh, in God's presence yeah. and, and doing it through the sacrifice of Jesus. So that just kind of connects a lot of the dots, I think. Yeah. Let me just... I, I'm going to repeat myself over and over again, but I don't want to lose sight of the fact that this class is ultimately about rest and peace. This isn't God's presence. I love this study. I have fun with this study for the sake of this study. But this isn't just God's presence for the sake of saying, oh, cool, here's a nice theology idea. This is how we're going to find that rest that we're looking for. It is found in connection with the presence of God. And so, you know, I'll start with the invitation talk right now. If you happen to be watching and, and you feel that, that desperate longing of, I want this peace, it's found in the presence of God. And you can't find it anywhere else except for in the presence of God. That's what we need to know more about. Um, so, okay, enough of that for now. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. There are a couple of, if we're going to talk about God's presence and dwelling place and Jesus saying, I'm going to build up the temple again, there's really more than just a couple passages, but there's a couple that I think we really have to read because they're so explicit. Um, 1 Corinthians 3 and verses 9 through 17. I know we don't need to read the whole text, but let's do it just to get a sense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. And this is what starts it. You're God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. Paul talking about what he did with the Corinthians. I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and fire will test what sort of work each one has done. 
if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. Okay. If anyone's work is burned up, he'll suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but not only through fire. Verse 16, 17. Do you not know, Paul saying to the Corinthian church, to these Christians, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Those two verses and that language especially is so huge in the Bible story, especially with the tabernacle and the temple. We're going to build it. God's spirit is going to come, and he's going to dwell among the people. And what Paul is saying to the church in Corinth is, you are that temple. You're that dwelling place. And the Spirit of God, His presence that we've been trying to connect with and be with all the time, it's in you, the church, God's people. How huge is that? Yeah. And this is what Jesus was talking about. I'm going to build it up in three days. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's what stood out to me is that the first thing we established was Jesus' body as a temple. But then he builds something that even transcends his own body. So that when he is back in heaven, there's still the sense that that he is with us yeah. and now through us and in us as the people who are the temple. Yeah. So I want to I want to make sure we don't lose what you just said there. No presence, no rest. You just said he is in us and through us, right? Where is the presence and the rest today? at least according to what you're talking about. It's in being connected with Jesus, being a part of God's people. Like you and I right here, we're a part of that God's presence thing. I think there's going to be some really serious implications that go with that. Mm -hmm. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. This is another big one. Ephesians chapter 2 and... It's kind of long, but I, I think I am going to go ahead and read it all. It's verses 11 through 22. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. He's talking about Gentiles, not Jews. Gentiles didn't have any access to God mm -hmm. in, in this situation. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and, look, without God in the world, no presence. But now in Christ, you who once were far off, let's go ahead and say far away from the presence of God, from the family of God's people, you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. That's our class who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Um, I think when you hear that, broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, how can you not think about the barriers in the tabernacle blocking us away from the presence of God? Jesus tore all that stuff down by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those of you who are near. And through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now we're talking about the house, the household of God. The house is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, their words, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure, the house, the temple, the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord in him, you also are being built together 
into a dwelling place of God by the Spirit. So here, Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. Through Jesus, we get access to God. That's your Hebrews 10. Access to God. Peace with God. Peace with one another because of God. And all of this stuff is we are these individual building blocks creating ultimately the house or the temple or the dwelling place of God where we can be in contact with his presence. It's Eden. Mm -hmm. That's all we're talking about. We're going back to the pre-sin world. You know, one thing I noticed in this passage of Ephesians 2 about us now as as the house of God um, is just that it's an ongoing process. And I like the analogy of like we're being built into a house. But I just noticed the, the present tense of a lot of these things mm -hmm. that, um, you know, it grows into a holy temple and we are being built together. And you can just almost think about this temple that God has made in us and we progressively over time grow stronger grow more mature you know it's like you you drive by a building and then you drive by later and you see new things being added and new layers and like we are supposed to be that kind of temple individually and collectively that is always being built up built up built up into the house of god yeah nerd fact time in 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 greek especially one of the very first things that you learn uh, whenever you start to talk about verbs is your present tense thing. Greek present tense is not only just here it is right now. There is a continuing ongoing aspect to that present tense. Is this a, the perfect tense or something? No, no, ah. no. It's present. It's actually present. Okay. It's really, Yeah. It's actually present. But the idea of present tense is ongoing continually happening which is just the technical part of the comment that you just made mm -hmm. we're not oh you're a christian you're a block in the temple of god you're growing the temple is a fluid thing that is continually growing and changing and building and we're all to make it so that we can be in contact with the presence of god that's the point I need to say this. I, I saw this the other day. Luke Moyer on Facebook wrote something on April 23rd about Romans chapter 8. And I thought that it fit so perfectly with what we're talking about. That I'm going to go ahead and read it. He said, I know there are lots of Christians with reservations about how the Spirit indwells the saints. And there's this great big debate and conversation about uh is the indwelling of the spirit an actual literal thing? I'm not even going to start to walk down that path in this conversation. Luke said this. There's reservations about how the spirit indwells the saints, but it is non-negotiable that the spirit does live in his people. If the spirit is not in you, you have no hope of denying the flesh and no hope of eternal life. And so I think Luke is just right on the money here. I don't find it to be, you know, a, a productive use of my time to try and define, well, how is God's presence happening? I don't know the answers to those questions. I'm, you know, I don't know. But I know that his presence is happening because that's the story of the Bible. And that's the picture of what God has described here in 1 Corinthians and Ephesians that we are being built up into the house of God and that his spirit dwells in us. Mm -hmm. It's a major point. Yep. I'm going to interject a couple of comments here All that right. we've had along the way. Um, one from the wise is just a few minutes ago, but I think it still really ties in well about God being with us didn't end with Jesus's ascension, but Jesus is available to all and we can be secure in the knowledge of our citizenship in God's kingdom through Jesus. Yeah. You know, that's what we're, talking about it being an ongoing thing that even as he physically left, he's still very much with us. And then um, from Steve Shetla talking about sort of the intersection of presence and rest, he says, uh, maybe because we are in part the continuation of the presence of Christ, part of the peace is offered when we're with one another and there's safety and rest and peace. There it is. There's my point. That's, I mean, okay, let's go ahead and uh, class is over. Steve has made the point. <laughs> That, I mean, that's that's it, right? Yeah. That's the thing. We 
this is as much of a criticism of myself as anybody else as I think about it. I'm walking around as this giant ball of high blood pressure and stress and anxiety. When my function as a part of the building and the presence of God is to be God's presence and rest in the world, I need to get that part figured out because I'm not doing it right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the ultimate practical application of this whole thing. Steve's point, I am a part of the presence and the rest that we need to share with the world. And if you're not a part of that presence and rest, then we need to be working towards that. Um, I know that it's easier said than done. <laughs> yeah. But but that's what we're doing in class. We're trying to be better tomorrow than we were today. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 6. I'm not going to read both of these passages, and uh, I guess three of them unless you want to. But um, in a couple of different places in the New Testament, you see the idea of, okay, so if we're going to do this, if we're going to do this presence of God and dwelling place of God thing, just like Eden and the tabernacle and the temple, what is what is the thing that caused God's presence to leave in all three of those situations? It was sin, right? It's the exact same thing. If, if I'm going to be a part of the temple of God and God's presence, sin can't be a part of the equation. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verses 19 and 20, that's another uh, one of the passages, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And this whole uh, text here starts in verse 12. It's all about sexual immorality. If you're going to be the temple and the dwelling place in the presence of God, you can't be using your body for sinful stuff. That's God said in Eden, I'm out of here. No, no, no. In Eden, he said, you're out of here. Mm -hmm. But with the tabernacle and the temple, sin and the presence of God don't mesh. And so that's another thing that we better get figured out. Yeah. Oh. Like how we're thinking of ourselves as the temple. Jesus was so zealous about cleaning out the physical temple as a picture of yeah. this is God's. This stuff doesn't belong here. And then we look into our own lives and say, okay, what's here that doesn't belong if I'm supposed to be the temple, you know, what are the things that I need to be throwing out and running out with the same kind of yeah. passion that Jesus did in the oh, earthly man. temple? That's a great point. I need to make sure and I need to make sure and, and write that in our notes. That's an that's an excellent point. And I'm dropping a comment or a question into the comments section now. If you kind of want to join in the conversation, as we're trying to make the subject of God's presence very practical and not just abstract. And so the question is how should God's presence among us and inside us influence the way that we live from day to day? So what does it mean if God is present? How does that change how we live? Um, so would love to hear your thoughts on that as we kind of keep exploring that. Yeah, I really, uh, if you want to, if you want to check these out, you can write them down. Second Corinthians chapter six and verse 14 through chapter seven and verse one. That's the don't be unequally yoked passage. And he says, what, what uh, connection does the temple of God have with idols? The idea is get that stuff out. And then first Peter chapter two and verses one through 11 is another one. You're uh, a part of this holy priesthood, the dwelling place of God. And all throughout first Peter two, sin can't be a part of the equation. Um, this is what makes Jesus so awesome. I'll, I'll go ahead and jump to my one of my main points here at the end. Not only is Jesus the actual presence of God, but he is he's the way that our sin problem can be corrected so that we can be in the presence of God. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I mean, it gets more important. He gets more important the more you learn about the biblical story. Mm -hmm. it's, it's unreal. It's huge. Okay, go to Revelation 7. Two last passages, and then I think I'll wrap this up, and we might even get done on time tonight. So we talked about number one, Jesus. We talked about number two, the church and the presence of God and God dwelling with us. All of these things are real. 
but they're not ultimate. Um, sometimes in biblical language, this is the way that you would refer to something like this. You would talk about the spirit that is here now in the presence of God. You'll talk about that as um, inaugurated. It has begun and it's here, but it's not consummated. It's not ultimate, the, the complete fulfillment of the presence of God. That's heaven. And through Jesus, and after living in this inaugurated presence of God here and now, the ultimate goal of Christianity is, is to go and to be in the unfettered, actual, literal presence of God. And that's where you see places like Revelation chapter 7. I'm going to start. Eh, I'm not going to read this one. Um, starting in verse 9, there is this great multitude from every nation and all tribes I'm going to jump down to about verse 14. Um, I guess verse 13. One of the elders addressed me saying, who are these? Who are, the, who are the multitude from every nation? Who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? And I said, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore... So saints who, the white clothes in Revelation is referred to as the deeds of the saints. Saints who have lived a righteous life, who have been cleansed of their sins by the blood of the Lamb. Verse 15, therefore, they are before the throne of God. That's, that's the whole point. Here's God. Here's God's people right in front of him. Mm -hmm. Unfettered access. They serve him day and night in his temple, in his house. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. There's our peace that we're looking for. The sheltering peace and presence of God. They shall hunger no more. Remember our very first lesson talking about God feeding his people so that they can have unfettered access with God. They're not going to be hungry anymore. They're not going to be thirsty anymore. The sun's not going to strike them in any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to the springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There's the rest. The rest that we're hunting for is ultimately found in the presence of God. There's one more, but that really is the point mm -hmm. in Revelation 21. Revelation 21 and verses 1 through 4. Do you want to read that? I've been talking a lot. Sure. Revelation 21, starting in verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. It's not just, oh, cool, heaven. It's the presence of God, and in the presence of God, there's a description of the rest that we're all looking for. I guess it's not a description of the rest. It's a description of all of the things that are not the rest yeah. that we're looking for. But all those things, they don't exist, the curse. So what's our formula? The, the presence is key. There's no presence of God in the presence of sin. Jesus has fixed our sin problem. Actually, the presence of God has fixed our sin problem. Now we can be in the presence of God and experience the rest that God offers. I don't know. I need to find some fancy way of saying it, you know, but presence, rest. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for rest and you're looking for peace, it's only found in one place. That's the moral of the story. You're not going to find it in a self-help book. You're not going to find it by listening to a meditation app. 
you know, and laying your head on your pillow. I'm not saying those things are not going to be helpful in some aspects of life. But if you're looking for the real ultimate rest that we all crave in our soul, it's only found in one place, and that's in the presence of God. Yeah. The, on, the only rest that's unshakable and can't be taken from us no matter what. And I think that's part of what we're seeing in these descriptions in Revelation is just the permanence that's built there. Yeah. Um, and I've been thinking about, even though it's true, it's so much of a gift that God gives to us, and yet there's still in this life, there's this this obligation on us to live in a way that's befitting for God to live among us. And to me, even if you think about earthly relationships, presence implies some degree of compatibility. And I, I, for whatever reason, the phrase I thought of was kind of a phrase you give kids growing up, like, as long as you're in this house, you're going to follow these rules. You know, mm -hmm. and God is saying to us, like, as long as you are my house, you're going to follow these rules. You know, you are me. You are the extension of me. And there is a, a holiness that we're supposed to be living up to so that it's a place that he can live and so that we can be um, starting to set ourselves up for enjoying his presence more fully yeah. forever. Yeah. I know that I'm always a little hesitant when we walk down that path. And I know you're not saying this. You're absolutely right. The holiness and 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 living as best we can. But we're not describing a works righteousness right. here. No, I'm glad you say that. The the way the the way that our sin problem has been fixed is through the blood of Christ. Yes. Not because I'm so awesome. But I have not been saved by my good works, but I have been saved for good works. Yeah. Which is what you're talking about. Live in God's house as if you belong in God's house. Yeah. No, I yeah. thank you for kind of coloring that in the way that I at least meant for it to come out. Yeah, so. no, no, it did come out yeah. that way. I just wanted to. At no, least it's a clarify. great, it's a, it's a perfect thing to clarify. And then just to share a couple of the last comments here about talking about what it means, how God's presence drives us, um, and and should influence our life. From Amanda, it's about imitating Christ to the point that others can see Christ through us. Mm. And something similar from Steve about His presence within us should make us a refuge and a place that people go to be built up. So I think that's what part of what we were talking about and this idea of us being a reflection of God yeah. so that people can see some of that in us and ultimately get pointed to him. Yeah. Yeah. Not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. God's presence. Yeah. Um, one last thing, and then I'll be done. This is just a big takeaway. And I, I, Becky and I were talking about this this afternoon, and this is really her point. And I've, I don't know how to explain it, but do you know one of the things that is totally mind boggling about this conversation to me is to think about the entire created universe and how big it is and how much of it there is. And the fact that God created all of it for the purpose of living in fellowship with humanity. And, and humanity messed that up. But the Bible is really the story of God saying, I'm coming to get you. And then they messed it up again. And God stayed away for a while. And then God said, I'm coming to get you again. And then humanity messed it up and he went away for a while. And, and then Jesus says, I'm putting on flesh and I'm actually going down there and getting them. And he came. And this whole conversation in our daily battle with sin is God saying, I, this is not the story of me wanting to be in God's presence. This is the story of God wanting to be in our presence. How can that not humble you? Yeah. I mean, it's a it's an unreal picture of the creator of the universe wanting to actually be with us. Yeah, yeah that, that takes it back to the Hebrews language in my mind, that he's the one who tore down the curtain, and he's the one who paved the way, and he's the one who, who gives us the access that we so desperately need. Yeah. So how are we going to get God's rest? Get out of your own way. God came to give it. It's 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 time to start seeing some of these things and, and getting after it. All right. Anything else? I think that's it. Thank you, everybody. It's really good to see you in this format, and I look forward to being with you all again in person soon.